Good morning again. This is Kathy Bush, and welcome to the Dandelion Medical Webinar on 100 Billion Neurons, Exploring the Next Generation of NICUs Designed to Support Optimal Brain Development. We're so pleased to have Kathy Randall this morning as our faculty presenter. Kathy's a neonatal nurse practitioner and clinical nurse specialist with more than 20 years of NICU experience. She has a passion for many things from the neonatal neuro NICU environment and beyond. She's had an interest in the subspecialty of neonatal neurology since her days as a bedside nurse, and her passion for this topic has taken her around the globe as an invited speaker and guest at a number of universities and conferences. Earlier this year, Kathy hosted the first ever Neuro NICU conference with more than 180 nurses in attendance from the U.S. and Canada, and Dandelion was very happy to be a sponsor of the conference, which was really amazing. I hope many of you were able to attend. Kathy's also finalizing a certification for nurses who have a passion for the newborn brain, and that will be available later this year. So, Kathy, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Can you hear me all right? Yep, hear you fine. Okay, great. Well, welcome and good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to all of you who are um, watching this as a recording. And I'm so excited to be able to talk about one 100 billion neurons um, today. So let's dive right in because as always, I've prepared a lot for you. So if you joined a few minutes ago, we were um, playing with a new tool that lets us do a little bit of a poll. So if you already um, have texted in once, I just wanted to get a sense for what is your role in the NICU? And so if you've already texted in Dandy once, all you need to do this time is just text in your response to that same phone number. So just go back into that. Um, perfect, staff nurse, awesome. So perfect. OT, therapist, manager. Isn't this fun? I love this. Education, therapist, staff, consultant, neonatologist, directors, amazing. So I love that we have, you know, many disciplines with us today to talk about not only the newborn brain, but the environment of care and really our culture of care that we're providing um, to our babies. And so we have educators, clinical nurse specialists, parents, child life specialists, nurses at the bedside, respiratory. So it's amazing because we need all of you together. We need all of us to, to work towards a common goal. And at the end, I'm going to invite you to, to maybe declare one thing that you're going to do different based on the information that we, we share and talk about today. So we need each of us from each of our respective disciplines to kind of think about what are we going to be doing differently with the information that we learned today. Awesome, I love this. All right, I hate to, to, to break up the good party, but we're gonna have more polls. So um, we'll just keep going um, for now. So the, the learning objectives for today are really to look at the stages of brain development, some of the, dis the disruptions that happen to those areas of brain development. I'm gonna talk about the four pillars of the next generations of NICU and some of the, the care principles. And then really one, give an example, I want you to be able to give an example of something that you can do to alter either the environment, <clears throat> a policy, or even just the culture um, to optimize brain care for babies who are in your NICU now. So I'm just going to start with a review, and this review is, you know, I, I hope is kind of fun for you. I love the brain, so it's always fun for me. Excuse me, I have a little frog in my throat this morning. So we're going to talk about how the brain changes. So I'll do just kind of an overview um, to get us started. So I think the, the thing I want you to really walk away with in this intro is just that the brain is changing not only from a structure point of view. And if you look at the picture on the right, you know, we see huge changes to structure, but also that the brain is changing in function as well. And that this is lasting for not only that fetal period, but really for the first five years of life. So we have periods of rapid growth where we know that the brain doubles after birth in about 90 days. And if I know you've all seen this 
um, chart that we've used, that we use all the time, right? We're plotting out our baby's um, head circumference and their length and their weights. But I want you to just really look at this, um, this graph and the slope of this graph for these first few weeks. And sorry, I wanted to make it big, so I kind of cut off the weeks at the bottom. But I know you're all pretty familiar with this. And this goes out for three years. So if you just look in those first few squares, you can really see, I think you can see my pointer, this slope, how fast the brain grows. And so by three years, the brain is about 80% of the adult size. And by, by five years, it's 90% of the adult size. And the other piece of this is it's not just all about size and mass, but it's also about the neurons themselves. And so when we look at this, this rapid growth, it's about 250 thousand neurons per minute are being born in that fetal and neonatal brain. And when we talk about not only the neurons, but then those neurons have to make connections together that we have about a hundred trillion connections between neurons at, by the age of three. So the other thing that happens with this rapid growth and all of this expansion of neurons is that in order to fit into the cranial vault, we actually need to fold the brain on itself so that it has increased surface area. And the number of folds really relates to intellectual capacity. And so when we look at a human brain, even compared to our closest relative, a primate brain, the human brain has far more um, sulci and gyri um, than even the primate. And we know that they share a lot of similarities with us. So this folding is really critical. And that's really caused by all that expansion of those, those neuronal connections. We also know that there's not only just the gray matter, but there's also white matter. And that, so we start out as mostly, um, we'll be starting, to, um, I will be sending out a copy of the PowerPoint, so not to worry, just relax into it and just take a few notes. And I promise you'll have all of this to review um, later. Um, but I want you to remember that we're changing not only from gray matter, but the white matter. And the white matter is really the myelin that happens. And we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. There's also huge synaptic changes that are occurring, and I love this graph, and again, I, to make it really big, I cut off parts of this graph that go out to adult, but you can see that when we look at synapses, you can see this big surge here. So you have a surge of them, and this is actually in our um, receptive uh, visual cortex. This is more of some of our language. And this is more of our motor. So that's what the three different lines are. You can see that there's these uprisings of all areas. And then they have a decline. So we have this thing that we call blooming and pruning. And so neural blooming is what's really happening between those years between zero and five. And we know that during this time, we're having this massive proliferation and that we um, are going to be putting down new um, pathways, but that if we don't use some of these pathways, pruning occurs, and it's kind of that use it or lose it where we really hardwire in the parts of our brain that we're using the most. And this is why when we have um, severe neglect, which I'll talk about, I'll talk about in a second, where we actually lose these areas if we don't actually get this blooming and the stimulation that we need in order for all this, these bloomings to actually happen. So let's step back. Now that we kind of have a framework for all the things that happen in the newborn brain, let's talk about in a little more detail about the three phases of brain development. So we have basically the embryonic phase, the fetal phase, and the neonatal phase. And probably you're all really familiar with this. And if you've heard any of my talks before, I always talk about critical periods of brain development. But we're going to go a little bit deeper today um, and, and get really into some of the anatomy of this. So, um, so first off, we have the embryonic phase, then we have the fetal phase, and we have that neonatal phase, and really on through early childhood and even adulthood. And so we're going to talk about these three phases and some of the really important pieces that are happening in these areas, some of them prenatally before our babies are, are viable and can find their way into the NICU, and then some of these things happening right in our NICU as well.
So the embryonic phase is really important and probably you you all have had a class on this at some point. So we'll just do a quick review. But really by the fourth week, we have the formation and the closure, if all goes well, of the neural tube. And at that point, the neural tube then begins to differentiate into its different pieces, into the hindbrain, the midbrain, the forebrain, and then, of course, the spinal column. So it differentiates that neural tube into its four different sections. By week seven, the cortex becomes visible, and you can see that um, here. Um, you can see that the, the actual cortex begins to be visible. We have an evolution of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And then we see that that cortex actually continues to proliferate and actually then covers up those structures, leaving the cerebellum visible and, of course, the spinal column below. And then by, by 12 weeks, we actually can see the differentiation of those two hemispheres. And, of course, from there, we continue on with that proliferation. And that proliferation really continues between 8 and 16 weeks. And this is where toxins, specifically environmental toxins, chemicals, and other um, substances that we'll talk about in a minute can really reduce the number of neurons. And so if we reduce the number of neurons, we reduce proliferation, we're going to not have as much folding, we're not going to have an, as much mass, and we're going to have issues later in life. So we can look at fetal MRI. And we can see that the volume of the brain should be increasing at a really nice slope over time. And so these are some great pictures that we can now do that we can do fetal MRI. We can actually look at this and we can actually plot out whether or not baby's brains are growing as expected. So after we have proliferation, we have migration. And this is, um, this is really important because we want to actually see this differentiation of these neurons. So they proliferate, but then they need to move out to different parts of the body or out to the brain. And migration is really critical for the development of the structure of the cerebral cortex and the deeper structures. And it's really happening in layers. And so I think that's really um, interesting. It all starts at what's known as the um, plate here, and then the fibers actually migrate all the way out. And then you can see that this is the beginning of that cortex or that gray matter. And these are unmyelinated fibers that they start in the beginning as unmyelinated fibers. So we can't really see them. And it's not until they myelinate that we really call it white matter. Of course, eventually it would be white matter, and that's why we call it white matter injuries. Um, but this is really what's happening is these Neurons are migrating out from this cleft and moving out to wherever they belong on the cortex. And you can see here, this is a more detailed picture of actually showing them sprouting. I think it's the coolest thing, right? How they, they sprout up. And they call these radial glials as they move to the places where they're designed to go. Um, this is another fetal MRI of a, a baby around 20 weeks, 21 weeks. And you can see here, a little bit, I don't know, it's a little blurry on my screen, so I'm not sure how it's showing on yours, um, but you can see here some of these layers, and that's really where you can see that the, the neurons were starting here and then pushing out to, um, to the actual, um, to the, the, the cortex itself. And so we, we have that moving, that radial movement outward that's creating all of that gray matter. And eventually this is all gonna myelinate in and that will be our white matter. So the next phase of our critical phases of development is organization. And this really peaks around 20 weeks and continues for many years even after birth. And so I love this picture where you can see this organization and again, this the synaptic structure that we have in the brain where you can look at the newborn and yes, there are synapses and yes, there are these dendrites that are being created, but that you can see that the connections are much stronger at one month and even more dense and, and complicated at nine months, two, two years in an adult. And so this organization that we have happening is really important and when we have disrupted organization, we can have a variety um, of issues that pop up. Um, this organization is the thing that allows us to function as an integrated whole. So it's not enough to just have neurons, but they need to be organized so that our brain can actually work 
together and be able to share information and to be able to integrate information into us. This is really that circuitry of the brain. And there are many pieces that go into this. So we've got synaptic development, which we, just, we talked about. There's neurotransmitters. So, you know, all of the um, development of neurotransmitters and that ability to, to send those signals across the cleft, um, all of that um, are really important. So um, Kathy's asking me about people. We have people on the phone. So let me just really quickly hear... Um, just stop sharing and I'll just pause, I guess. So people are asking for the PowerPoint now. So let me just quickly see if we can switch that. And I apologize, but we'll try to make this a good experience Kathy, for I, all of you. I I think it's okay. There's just a few people that are having trouble. I'm trying to deal with it offline. So I think the majority of people are hearing you fine. Okay. Well, what I'll do um, really quick is I can just shoot you over the, the, um, PowerPoint, and then maybe we can email that out to Kathy, we are not hearing you, so um, hang on, everyone. She must have just gone away to try to get the recording up. Just stay tuned. Am I back? <laughs> oh my gosh. I hope that you yeah, all so we, are we can hear hanging you. in there. We can hear you, uh, but we can't see your slides anymore. That's okay. So what I was going to do to for all of you really fast is... Um, I think you should just come back and we'll send the PowerPoint later. Okay, we'll do that. So I'm going to go here and share my screen and maybe you'll be back. All right. So sound is back. Awesome. Good to go. Dr. Good to go. All right. Good to go. All right. So we were talking about the organization and just circuitry and how important that is. 
And one of the things I want you to think about is that when we're trying to get these um, the circuitry together, that really, this is really when we're talking about stabilizing that brain structure and those cell connections. And the way that we want to, that's really that firing together, wiring together. The more that we have experiences, the more um, strongly those um, connections are, are kind of built into us. And so this is really the basis for a lot of us where a lot of our old habits um, come from or some of these early, early life experiences that we have um, that really create who we are. And then if we are, if we persist in that long enough and then we myelinate those fibers, we really hardwire um, that in. And so organization, I want to just share this slide really quick. So this is a healthy, normal brain on the left. And on the right is a brain of a baby who has been exposed to fetal alcohol syndrome or who has fetal alcohol syndrome. This is obviously post-mortem. And I don't know if you, if you can really appreciate it. So I drew this here just to really show you this organization. So you can see on the left side that the brain is, you know, it's folded and it looks like it's a little disorganized, but truly it has a really nice round shape that's very symmetrical and that the folding is very you know, systematic. Whereas if we look at the right side of the brain, yes, it has some mass to it, but you can see that the gyri are much more convoluted and the experience here of this brain is much more disorganized. And so I think sometimes we talk about this, uh, a dysfunction of this, the phase of brain organization and neuronal organization, but it, it's hard to sometimes conceptualize that. So I love this slide. Um, and it really is a profound difference. And it, it really does attribute to some of the difficulties that children with fetal alcohol syndrome have later in life. So let's talk quickly about myelination. So myelination is that fatty covering that insulates our circuitry. And really the purpose of the myelin is to enhance the, the effectiveness of the transmission. And so we want to have these, um, these cells be able to communicate quickly and the quicker, the better. And this is why, especially as we start to get into our motor skills later in life, that myelin is really important so that we can move quickly and react. And of course, that breakdown of myelin happens later in life um, as that begins to erode and our movements become slower and the impulses become slower. So it's really about myelin is really not that the nerves are not working, but it's that the nerves become much more efficient. Um, and even the cool thing is um, the, in some cases, they can actually, the impulse doesn't even need to transmit down the dendrite. It can actually jump the dendrite through the little nodes um, and actually have even faster um, action. So myelin is really important. It starts around 16 weeks um, of gestation. It takes off around 24 weeks, but it's not really mature until two years. So it starts at 16, takes off at 24, mature at, at two, and it happens in a predictable way. So we have more myelination in the central than we do in the peripheral in the beginning. Caudal to rostral, dorsal, ventral. And what I think is the most interesting in this list sensory to motor. So we myelinate that sensory part of our, our world before the motor. And what do babies use first? The sensory. They're more disorganized, less developed in the motor. And so the body is so smart that it's able to do this, but this means that their sensory experiences are much more mature and much more capable of um, transmission because those are the parts of the, the brain, especially as you get into those, um, those first years of life where the sensory is much more mature and capable um, than, than even the motor. And so these are just some great MRI pictures where we look at 28 weeks, 34 weeks, and we can begin to see um, some nice definition of the um, gyri. So you can see how smooth um, the brain is here and then the gyri here. And then at 40 weeks, you can obviously see um, some of the myelination starting to happen here with these little um, arrows in the middle. And then you can also see at 40 weeks, just you know how much uh, more defined some of the folding has become. 
And then down here, we have five months. And you can see, again, how much deeper, how much bigger the structures are. And again, um, that white matter really starting to fill in. We see the red arrow down on the uh, letter C. Um, this myelina myelination really does continue through life. And again, this just reemphasizes um, looking at um, language development. And so you can see that the blue dots are all the sensory pathways. And you can see that they start out kind of myelinating that you know, more dense and, um, and earlier. And then of course the language centers don't really even begin to really myelinate um, much until you start getting here into the four or five months. And then you start getting some of that more expressive language. And then of course, as we get out in age, we can see that those peak out uh, much later. So I think it's interesting, again, the sensory part of language coming out first, and then of course the other pieces later. So um, this is a little blurry slide, but just to kind of just say, you know, we're taking this kind of unformed, differentiated neural tube, you know, dividing it up into these different sections and then maturing it. But there are many, many things that can go wrong. And so I want to talk just for a minute before we dive into the NICU about some of these threats to brain development, because there are many biological and environmental threats. And, and some of these things are really outside of our control. So there are things that that are um, toxic. So I just showed you the um, baby that has fetal alcohol syndrome and some of those things that happen. Other things that maybe we don't always think about are maternal stressors, things like poverty, nutrition, and then some other ones that I think we're starting to learn more and more about, which are just congenital issues. And I specifically want to talk about the cardiac baby um, as well. So we have here just a little um, schema here of the maternal or prenatal stress. And so that prenatal stress can actually be transmitted to the fetus through the placenta, through mom's stress hormones, altering DNA, causing complications, causing growth restriction, low birth weight, other causing other epigenetic changes, and even lifetime risks of mental illness and other illnesses as well. So I mentioned cardiac babies. So what we now know with fetal MRIs is that babies who have cardiac disease and specifically hypoplastic left um, have a much different trajectory of brain development. And so, yes, we know that there can be other you know, structural malformations of the brain and other developmental issues that we've already talked about. But just knowing that babies who have cardiac disease also that that defect in flow in the heart is causing a defect in flow to the brain. And you can see that the blue, um, the red line are the controls. And so they're kind of going here as the, this is total brain volume. And then so this is increasing along this nice red line. Um, that's over time. And you can see that the babies with congenital heart disease actually have a much slower slope. So their brains are different even from the get-go. So we used to always think it was surgery or bypass or um, meds that they got that was causing some of their issues, but they actually start out with a little bit of a um, different brain. So what are some of the neonatal threats? So that's the prenatal threats. What about the neonatal threats? Well, again, there are still toxic exposures that can happen um, to our babies. Malnutrition, Babies who are not able to feed well or who don't get enough nutrition during that new neonatal period so that they can repair and, um, and grow their brains. And then, of course, I think we all acknowledge prematurity. And then if you've heard Mary Coughlin speak at all on toxic stress um, and distress, we know that those are also threats to the neonatal brain. And these are threats that last um, for many, many years. So I thought I would just kind of show you this picture of an orphan from a Romanian orphan. Of course, we've probably all seen these photos um, before, but on the left side, we have a healthy brain. 
and we can see all of this activity. So the red areas are areas of high activity. The black areas or the purple areas are, are less activity. And then we see an, an abused brain or a ne neglected brain. So again, remember, we're, we're waiting for this big, giant blob of neurons. They're waiting for experiences to happen. And if they don't happen, they regress and they go away. They are pruned away. And so we can see here in this abused or neglected brain that when they are deprived in infancy of love and care and interaction, parts of the brain just go away. In childhood, um, we can have the consequences of prematurity. So if our baby had an IVH, if the baby had um, you know, infection and, and other issues, um, we can have um, some complications of prematurity that carry us with brain issues into childhood. There's also um, things like maternal depression, where a mother has the inability to serve and return interactions with their baby. They're depressed, they don't take care of the baby. There's even um, situations of poverty and neglect where infants are living in these experiences of malnutrition and all of that can continue to threaten that brain development, which causes a social burden um, as time goes by. So this is a um, picture of a three-year-old, and these are um, old Im images, but you can see the difference between a baby who has been experienced extreme neglect and a, a normal three-year-old brain. And you can see a shrunken cortex, a smaller corcus, um, corpus callosum, and smaller hippocampus, and it's all indicated here by the lines. But just to say that there are these things, these biological, these social, these environmental factors um, that certainly play into, into um, our brain health, and certainly all things that we can advocate for, um, and just wanted to kind of shine some light on not only the NICU, but kind of the experience um, beyond. Um, so the other thing I wanted to just talk about really quickly is um, those consequences of prematurity. And certainly we do know that some babies leave with um, bleeds and seizure disorders, but there are some infants who do leave the NICU without any of these um, kind of diagnosable issues, and that the consequences of prematurity can last a lifetime. And so in this particular slide, this is a study coming out of the UK where they're able um, actually, I think this was in um, Germany. They were actually able to study their preemies over time. And so this is looking at IQ scores of premature infants at 26 years of age, 359 of them, and comparing them to full-term cohorts. So the, pre the term babies are in blue and the preterm babies are in red. And then you can see that in all areas of IQ scores that the... Um, that the preterm infant scores lower. And this is interesting that this difference persists for years and years to, to come. Another kind of interesting um, phenomenon that we've all become more aware of, I think, in the last decade is just the incidence of psych disorders in premature infants. And so I share this with you just to remind you that some of these things are not diagnosable by ultrasound, by MRI, by by any of our sophisticated monitoring, and that these are just consequences of the experience of dis disordered and disorganized and injured neurons. And so in this particular um, slide, you can see these are premature, premature infants, so infants born less than 26 weeks, and this is looking at them at 11 years old. And we can see if we look at just any disorder, a psych disorder here, um, that we can see that the blue column is our preterms, and the red the red column is the um, term born classmates, and so we can see that of any disorder, um, the preterm babies more than double, almost one and a half times more frequently have psych disorders. If we break it out into specific kinds of disorders, we have the um, ADHD, we have um, attention issues. And so we have that here. We can see that the premature infants are more at risk, emotional issues more at risk, and autistic disorders more at risk. Is the audio okay? I'm here. I'm getting, I'm seeing some chat. Yeah, so if you guys fine. 
Okay, thanks. Um, and then conduct disorders, I always think this is this part is funny, is um, we can see here that, you know, the term babies are a little worse off in the conduct area, that the preterms, they're just about the same. So not really any, any difference there. So I think it's just important to know that, you know, we focus a lot on you know, brain injury, white matter injury, you know, PVL, IVH, and by all means, I'm going to talk about some things that we can do to improve those outcomes. But I want you to think about some of these other types of disorders that are coming from the, the, the organization of the brain and that some of the sensory overload that's happening and stress that's happening from the get-go for a lot of these babies. So with all of this kind of knowledge about the, the threats to brain development, so many of the things that we've been working on for decades, neuro NICUs are really popping up all over the globe. And, and I have really had the honor to work with many hospitals um, around the world. So from Brazil to Thailand to here in the United States um, with, with clinicians who are looking to find new ways to really care for the baby's brain in a new way and to put a new light and focus on the newborn brain. And so with that, I, I believe that the next generation of NICU care really has these four pillars as we think about the newborn brain and newborn brain care. And so these four pillars, I'm going to dive into each of them a little bit, and then we'll talk about um, what are some of the specific interventions that we can all do. So we'll first off with assessment, because really the cornerstone of clinical care is assessment. And still, there is no greater and more powerful tool than the clinical assessment. It's still one of the most um, powerful ways that we can, can look at prediction of outcome. And so the pillar, the first pillar is really neuroassessment and using our clinical, our clinical skills, but really also utilizing clinical tools that can help us to standardize the way that we're speaking about neuroassessment. And I think a, it was a few months ago that um, Bobby Pineda was here on a webinar for Dandelion, and she talked about the importance of standardized neuroassessments. And she gave us a, you know, a great variety of, of reasons why we should use that and some options for that. And so I would invite you to check out that webinar if you haven't yet really standardized your neuroassessments um, in your unit. I would also think about um, other types of things that you do every day that maybe you don't think of as neuro assessments. So um, we obviously do pain assessments every day and pain assessments are fantastic ways to get at a baby's neuro status. Um, you can use things like the Dubowitz exam. You can do things like the Finnegan scoring if you have for neonatal abstinence. So any tool that can help us to be more objective um, can really enhance and improve our neuroassessment and help us to really um, dive in and clue in to infants that are having issues. The second pillar and one of my favorite pillars of all is bedside brain monitoring and really bringing the power of some of these tools to us. And I, I really just want to, you know, show this really quickly and say, you know, if we think about all the monitoring that we do in the NICU, continuous monitoring, temperature, SATs, respiratory, heart rate, blood pressure, but really what about the brain? And so when we boil it down, we really have two options. Um, we have um, brain function monitors. So that would be e EEG or amplitude integrated EEG, which I love teaching about amplitude integrated EEG um, because there's so much power in being able to have a tool at the bedside to look at function. But then there's also newer technology that can look at end organ perfusion and um, and we and I have some online classes where if you want to learn more about any of these kinds of things, you can definitely um, you know do that as well. So I just wanted to um, ask you all really quickly. So if you have your texting handy or if you want to use the chat area, um, no, 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 where, no matter where you are. So tell me what kind of brain monitoring, since this is definitely a new area for a lot of nurseries, what kind of brain monitoring are you doing in your nursery? I'd love to know, you know how much this pillar is already taking, taking off. So we have one couple person. So you're using mirrors on kids for ECMO. Thanks, Mary Lou. So a lot of AEEG, AEEG, 
doing all of the above. So you're doing video EEG, NEARS, video EEG and AEEG, but not yet doing NEARS, okay? You can text in more than one answer too, for those of you who are wondering. So some of you doing a lot of AEEG is coming through on the, on the chat area. Great, <laughs> no worries, Mary. <laughs> Great. You're using all of them, but not often. So that's interesting. Yeah. So I think this is, you know, having bedside brain monitors is great, but it's, you have to use them frequently um, to feel comfortable, to feel confident with them. Um, well, this warms my heart. I have such a passion for AEEG. So I love that. <laughs> I love that it's AEEG is winning out right now. Um, great. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, it's nice to know you're all still out there. Um, all right. So the third pillar of this kind of new generation um, is, is really looking at neuroprotection. And so when we think about neuroprotection, we really used to consider it, you know, anything that would help to prevent cell death. And of course, this is a very important thing, right? We want to prevent injury whenever we can and prevent cell death, um, especially neuronal cell death. But we really have begun to start to think of neuroprotection as really any intervention that can promote normal development and to prevent any disability. So really trying to protect that brain um, from damage and injury. And so prevention, of course, is really important. And if we talk about our very low birth weight infants, this is an old article, but I, I always love to share it because I think it really um, showcases for us the different potentially best practices, and this by no means is the full list out of this article that was published in Pediatrics back in 2003, but I love to use this as, a, as an opportunity. So if you pull this article and you take a little scorecard of where you are in your unit and where this list of potentially best practices are, you know, I think that what we now know about the brain is that a multiple prong approach is best. And so that one, you know, just doing one thing is not enough. We kind of have to come at these injuries and these potentials for injuries from a lot of different ways. And so I love this because it helps us to think of all the different, different things that we can do. And so you can see here, there's things like um, on this list, minimizing pain and stress, avoiding early LPs, optimal positioning, treating hypotension, optimizing respiratory support and non-invasive ventilation, limiting, limiting, uh, limiting or eliminating completely bicarb use, um, using our um, steroids, postnatal steroids very judiciously. Having management by neonatologists and nurse practitioners, so having a dedicated team for small babies. And again, this is a short list of things that are in this article. And obviously, in the 15 years since this is published, there are actually more potentially best practices. And if you participate in Vaughn, you can participate in the brain bundles. There's just so many different ways to go about trying to protect the brain. And I'm, I'm so happy, again, that there's so many of you from so many different disciplines, because I think we can really come at this from so many different ways. So one of the things that pops up on here a lot is maintaining midline head positioning. And um, I wanted to just ask again, so either through chat or um, through the texting, um, tell me a little bit about what your policy is for midline head positioning. Are you doing it? Are you not doing it? Are you doing it for a day, 24 hours, 72 hours a week? Tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing in your unit. So you can either text it in and it'll show up on the screen or you can do through the chat area. This is one of like the questions that comes up a lot. So 72 hours, all babies less than 32. Thanks, Kathleen. Not doing it. 72, midline 72, 72, midline 72. So midline 72. So 96, someone's doing 96. Some people are saying not doing it. Not doing it. 72 for less than 32. So I think it's interesting, try to do most of the time, first five days, not doing it. Um, so what I was just doing a talk last night and we were talking about this. So as you continue to um, text in, I'll share a little bit. 
from admission, um, not doing midline. I think it's so interesting. So much variability in our practice, right? So 72 hours, but instead of weeks, you're doing 900 grams. So the question is, um, you know, number one, I think a lot of times we think about midline and we think about midline and we think about that's only supine. So midline is not only supine. We can have babies in midline orientation um, from really, you know, on their sides and we can try to support them even in prone to um, use some rolls and bolsters and, and do things. So being midline is not only just about being supine. So I think that a lot of times we get that. Um, the other is that I wonder how we're really auditing this. And how are we ensuring that this policy that we believe to be important is really being implemented? And so I just want to maybe challenge you to think about like in your units, you have this policy, but do you know, are you, how good are you at doing this? So if you've, if you've decided that this is an intervention that you'd like to do, you know, are you a hundred percent that babies are getting this and how do you document it? How do you monitor it? Are you auditing it? Are you sharing with staff? Um, I think, you know, always measuring where we're, where we're doing, especially if you started as a new intervention, because then you could measure, you know, your pre and post, maybe it does make a difference in your rates of IVH. And honestly, I think if you could prevent one IVH, that would be a worth, worth the effort. And for those of you who aren't doing it, um, it'd be interesting to hear from, from you all too. Um, you know, the question would be, um, what, why not? Um, do you not believe the evidence is there yet? Um, do you do you think it doesn't make a difference? Do you get resistance? Um, so I think this is one of these things, right? You know that we have this variability in practice, and we're not quite sure all of of why we're doing this. the The theory behind it is that that most people believe that the vessels in the neck are are quite um, fragile and that we don't want to, you know, tweak the neck and, and maybe occlude those vessels and cause a, a, a hypoxic or an ischemic event. And, and then we don't want to cause a reperfusion injury. I think really for my own personal bias, I think it's about comfort. I think babies who are midline are more comfortable, who then have better vital signs, better stability, and then have um, less fluctuations in oxygenation and blood pressure. And so I think it's midline is really all about comfort. Um, and I'm not, I'm not hundred percent convinced myself that it's all about the perfusion. So what about other complications? There are many um, mounting evidences for um, some other complications. So inflammation um, and infection, and we know that those have impacts on the brain. And so I want you to just rethink through the lens of neuroprotection, some of the things you're already doing, ventilator induced brain injury. You're already trying to get babies um, trying to get babies um, off the ventilator and on non-invasive support. You have sepsis prevention and NEC prevention. All of these things are really neuroprotective. We also offer interventions to contain injury, and this is also another way to protect the brain. So most of you um, are probably familiar with hypothermia for babies who have HIE, so either body cooling or head cooling, and we know that this has been shown to reduce death but also to not cause additional neuro impairment. So we don't just save babies and have an injury, um, injured baby. But we also know that not every baby is helped by hypothermia. And there are a number of studies going on looking at later hypothermia, hypothermia treatment, plus some medications. So we're trying to find ways that we can really improve the care and protect that brain. Another important thing that we can do to protect the brain is to identify and treat seizures. Seizures are extremely metabolic, and these are um, this is why we need to be using bedside brain monitoring, and we need to be using it for all of our high-risk babies. Um, seizures can accelerate cell death in hypoxic injury, and so this affects neurogenesis, and we see this in the animal models. And we know that when babies have HIE and seizures, that they have a higher risk of mortality, and a higher risk for disability at 19 months. So babies who have an, an injury who then sees have a worse outcome. And so we wanna make sure that we're um, definitely looking for this. And we know that small babies who have seizures early in life have worse outcomes as well. So identification and treatment of seizures is a very important neuroprotective strategy that we can all be using. 
The final pillar and one of my favorites is really neurodevelopment. And when we talk about neurodevelopment, we're really just talking about providing an environment of care, a culture of care that really safeguards sleep, optimizes that nutrition, minimizes stress, protects the skin, partners with families, and is overall a healing environment. And so let's break this down a little bit and really think about what are we doing when we're providing neurodevelopmental care. We're really looking at ways to grow new neurons and nurture the neurons we have. So let's talk about what are some of the things we can do to grow new neurons. Well, there are many investigational um, options that are being um, looked at now, epigen, stem cells, IGF. But there are also practical, real-world things that we can do today that we know already grow new neurons. So things like massage and kangaroo care. So kangaroo care, and this is a um, several different studies that have been done looking at brain outcomes, specifically EEG, MRI, and long-term outcome. We know that kangaroo care reduces mortality, reduces nosocomial infections, you know, also um, amazing things that we need to be doing to grow our babies, avoiding infection, and increasing weight, length, and head circumference. We also know that it increases Bailey scores, increases IQ scores, as well as increasing EEG maturity. So here we see an approved MDI, so that's the motor um, function or mental function and then P, the physical. Um, so at one year, so babies who get kangaroo care have a higher, basically higher IQ. So parental massage is another way to really provide increased neuronal growth and um, if you've heard Kara Ann Waitsman speak about massage, this is definitely neonatal massage. Um, this is an amazing way to offer neuro nurturing care in your nursery every single day. So what about these neurons that we have? So maybe they were injured, maybe they didn't get all of what they needed to be nourished in the beginning, but what can we do to nurture the neurons we have now? And there's really about five things that I really wanna focus on um, here as we kind of wrap up the day. So number one is nutrition. I think this is something that we can all really look at whether or not we're doing optimal nutrition because that's really neuroprotective and helps that brain to be nourished. But other things that we can do are reducing that stress and pain. And I love this paper by um, Newman and Woodall, um, or Woodward and Ender. They looked at this NICU infant stress record. And if you've not seen this article, I would highly recommend that you pull it and the reference will be in the handout so you'll be able to go back. But they created this awesome checklist where they would look at extremely stressful things and then not so, so stressful things. So things like ultrasound, mouth care, even wiping the eyes. And they would give a score to these things. And if a baby had a score of six in this two hour period, no one was allowed to mess with the baby for two more hours. They didn't allow the baby to have a score of more than six. The interesting thing was that they, um, so this is a really cool tool. I would recommend pulling it, looking at it, and reading through, through this idea of kind of just, again, measuring, measuring the stress of our babies in the unit with a really um, practical tool. But this was the follow-up of these kiddos. And they looked at that NISS score, that was that stress score, and this is the average scores that the kids had. And then they looked at the brain development over time. And so obviously the lower the scores, the, the um, higher the scores, the, um, the higher the brain maturation. And then they showed the, the, as the scores got higher and higher, the actual size of the brain got smaller. So you can see here that this is a baby who didn't have, uh, had low stress. This is babies who had moderate stress. And these are babies over here on um, letter C who had high stress. And you can see there's differences in this functional MRI. The babies who had low stress or no stress, they have all these great lighting up here in some of the, um, these are connectivity scores, but they have alterations in the brain for babies who had more stress. So I just think it's interesting to see that you can actually measure this later in life as well. 
So what is another thing you can do? You can offer positive sensory experiences. So remember how we talked about what myelinates first, what's developed first? The sensory system develops before that motor system is really developed. So offering positive sensory experiences is a really good way to offset some of the toxic stress that we know is going to be inevitable in the nursery. So balancing out these sensory experiences, we know we do a lot of ouchy things and not so pleasant things, but what about offering some positive things um, to our babies? And so we love that. And again, just remembering that these different senses are really heightened by our, by our babies um, because they are so highly developed and because that sensory system develops before the motor system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's think about this really quick. So tactile, the tactile system is intact right from eight to 12 weeks, especially the oral um, set, you know, tactile sensory is very highly um, innervated. So let's talk about and just chat in, use your chat area. What are some of the positive things you're offering in your nursery related to tactile? So skin. Love to see what are some of the things you're doing. Oral care with mom, kangaroo, love it. How about hand hugging, infant massage, swaddling, skin to skin, awesome. Yeah, advising to not be um, intentional touch, I love that. Two-person care, kangaroo, awesome. What about the vestibular system? Hand, parent hand massages, skin to skin oral. I love this. I love it. What about the vestibular system? What are you doing to support the vestibular system? Anybody doing swaddling and moving slowly? Quarter turns. Awesome. Yep. Slow movements. Try to move the baby slowly. Infant massage. Awesome. How about that standing transfer? versus the UFO flying baby through the air when we're doing kangaroo. Yeah. Or how about some of you remember this, the preemie flip? So if you are not having been practicing very um, long, you probably don't remember it. Yeah, mom taking, I love these. I, I love this. But the preemie flip was something we used to do, right? And sometimes we still see babies like this when we do that um, transfer. Um, yeah, Kathleen, I know, right? <laughs> Uh, so vestibular system. And of course, gustatory. You know, you've already mentioned oral care with mom. Olfactory, I'm sure you're all doing. Um, yeah, insisting on more than one person. I love these comments coming through. So we can think about this sensory development and how strongly developed it is and just all the options we have for minimizing negative and maximizing positive we acknowledge there are many negative things we have to do, but let's think about and really integrate and document the positive things we're doing. I think this is one of the things that we do, we're doing it. I think we're just not documenting it very well. You know, if you're doing skin to skin, are you saying how many minutes a day? Are you able to measure, you know, this baby had 700 minutes of skin to skin versus this baby had 200 minutes, you know, in how much time? Do you have a goal for that in your unit? Um, I think these are all things we can be thinking about to try to make our units better. Minimizing that stress and parent separation. If you've heard Dr. Phillips on some of the previous webinars talk about this, I know you know. We know that separation of moms and babies causes disruptions in hormones. We know it causes stress, and we know that it can actually alter bonding um, as well as, as many other things in, in years to come. We need to protect sleep. This is, there are so many potential interventions on protection of sleep. Um, and one of the things I think that disrupts sleep the most is the noise in the NICU. And, um, and I think just being aware that there are, again, things we can do to improve the environment. So whether that's more maternal voice, whether that's private rooms, whether that's making sure that we have someone speaking to the patient and to the baby with every single interaction, introducing yourself, being silly. Hi, baby, I'm here to give you your, 
you know, five o'clock Milicon and, you know, or whatever, right? So um, you can just, you know, use noise as the negative, but there is sound that is valuable and we need to find ways to bring positive sound into the nursery and, and bring the, um, you know, bring the negative away. Disruptions of sleep cause disordered sensory systems. And this is for time and time in the future. We know we, that disrupted sleep and lack of sleep causes disordered memory, even for us, as well as loss of cortical plasticity into adulthood and smaller brains. Sleep is so important. And so we want to always protect sleep. The final thing that we want to do to provide good developmental care is to really promote this strong bonds between the family and the baby. And so we want to do this, all of these things together. We want to minimize stress. We want to offer positive. We want to minimize that parent separation, protecting sleep and protecting and promoting strong bonds. We really know that babies who are connected to their families and their families who are connected to babies, they're going to show up at appointments. We know that they're going to get the care they need. And then we know that they're going to, they're going to thrive more than, than the babies where the families feel disconnected. So I feel like it may seem fluffy, but that bond between that baby and that family is so important. And whatever we can do and all of these things we've been talking about can help us to really improve that and which will really nurture that brain. So as just kind of some final thoughts, you know, brain injuries are reality for our babies. They're very much at risk for this. Sometimes they're admitted for brain injury. And it is the organ that is going to give us the greatest impact in our quality of life. We have the opportunity as we begin to coordinate care and as we begin to kind of look at that next generation of our NICUs and what is this going to look like, we want to think about kind of coordinating care and really having these um, benefits and thinking about the benefits to the brain and really thinking about what is that impact that we're having, whatever we're doing um, today. So um, just in the sake of time, I'll just kind of review again the four pillars of this neuroconscious care. So we want to really think about assessing our babies, looking at their response to our care, you know, using that to guide and individualize care, but as well as using some of our, you know, clinical assessments, looking at imaging and those things. We want to do neuromonitoring because we know that we can look at function and we can be able to even gauge um, babies' response to, to um, therapy. And of course, we want to protect and we want to nourish this brain. So I think I've given you some ideas of, of ways to kind of maybe look at where you are now and then maybe think about for a little bit where you're going. And these neuro NICUs, it's, you know, it's an amazing trend. I think it's brought a lot more awareness around um, to, to the brain. But I, I want you to also know that you don't have to have a neuro NICU or even be interested in having a neuro NICU to want to provide better brain care in your unit every day. And it can be just a QI project. It can be exactly what I just said. How many minutes of kangaroo care are your babies getting in the first two weeks of life? I mean, you could even just do that and see what you could do. You could take a program you already have and expand it. You could formalize it. You could, you could call yourself a neuro NICU. You could, you know, do those things. You could just decide to change your environment or you could change one piece of your unit culture. So I think there's just so many ways that we can go about um, worrying, you know, like making ourselves, you know, better, more neuroconscious places. So um, what do you, what's the one thing you want to do to alter your environment, to alter a policy, a practice, a culture? What's one thing you think you could do in your unit? Maybe it might take you, you know, a little while to get a little team together to do it. But what's one thing that you'd like to work on in your unit? So some people are saying midline positioning. Awesome. You can either text it in or you can use the chat, whichever way you'd like. Parent education. Yeah. Improving sleep. Kangaroo care. And we can use the, um, you can use AEEG or EEG monitoring. You know, if you're already monitoring babies, you can look at these um, sleep cycles. You can measure it very much. Decreasing noise. 
Having child life specialists more. Yes, we need them. Procedural pain control. Awesome. Measuring voices, voice levels. Improvement project on developmentally supportive bathing. Yeah, I didn't even show my swaddled bathing page um, pictures. I love this question. How to get management to buy in. Positive touch. Swaddled weights. Swaddled weights. I know. What an easy, easy. Revising your IVH bundle. Decreasing noise and alarm fatigue. So important for staff trauma as well as baby trauma, right? I love it. I love all these things you guys are working on. Teaching parents infant massage. Absolutely. Massage, massage, massage. Yeah. Kangaroo. I love it. I love it. Well, I think that, you know, really what I wanted to, you know, to share is just that I want you to be the change. I want you to find that thing in your unit that you're passionate about. I want you to find that, you know, a few friends um, that might be willing to write up a plan, measure it. Uh, I think the question to um, what do we do for management? I think a lot of times our management, and if there are managers here, I, I would love for you to chime in too. I mean, I think that, that they're pushed from all directions and that numbers and data speaks loudly. And I think if you can begin to measure, you know, even just a week or two weeks of your current practice and then to create a pathway, I think management is, is all about, you know, helping babies and helping us give the best care we can. And I think, you know, if we come to them with a problem and a solution and, you know, and, and that you're really willing to step up and step out and say, I want to lead in this way. Um, you know, I certainly think that most um, managers would, uh, would love that. So again, if there are any managers in there um, who would like to say, you know, any comments about that, I, I mean, I think it's a great question. Um, but that would be, that would be something I'd say, you know, measure it first, you know, show the problem, you know, and then offer what you think a solution can be. So I just wanted to remind everyone that um, for my, my new company is synapsecare.com. We have a, a how-to series on a variety of those um, topics that we talked about for um, how to create a neuro NICU. And so things about massage and small baby protocols. And so we have a lot of free how-to videos. Um, so I would just invite you um, to look there as well before you have to, um, to jump off. But I, my email is here, Kathy at synapsecare.com. I'm always happy to entertain questions. And um, I think we'll take it back to Kathy Bush and see if there are any other um, questions and I'll make the screen big so we can see all the chat a little bit easier. Great, Kathy. Thank you so much. You're having amazing comments from everyone. And it was really, really fun to see all the things that people were sharing. Yes. Um, we will try to gather that information and see if we can even post that. Um, if you go back and look at the recording, when you get the link to the recording. Okay. Um, and so you can write down other people's ideas. I think that would be terrific. But there were tons of questions that were coming in while you were speaking. So if you have other questions, please write them in the chat area now. But if yeah. not, um, Maybe I have a them. Kathy that I picked up. So one person asked, does neck rotation caused by prone positioning affect brain perfusion? And then there was other ones about basic positioning and brain perfusion. Oh, I love these questions. Yeah. So, um, so there have been a, a few different studies using the NEARS. So NEARS is the brain perfusion monitor that I talked about. And so looking at several different positions, including prone, and they haven't really yet been able to identify through NEARS. Um, now, again, that's just perfusion. So it doesn't mean that there's not potentially flow issues, um, but there haven't been really any um, differences documented using NEARS. I think that one of the things that, that again, I, I think that you can just be aware that, you know, infants who are relatively stable have intact autoregulation of the brain. And I think that a lot of times we, we, we worry about, we know our preemies are at risk for lacking autoregulation or having pressure passive circulation. And so in those states, when an infant is very sick, acidotic, you know, extremely ill, 
we know that they are are more at risk for for lacking autoregulation. I think that a, a baby who is otherwise relatively stable to be prone, their body is designed to compensate for that and to maintain good perfusion to the brain. And so I think, is there risk, you know, anatomical risk if you kind of torque the neck? I, I go back again to comfort. And so the studies haven't shown using mirrors that there's really any difference. Um, but I think people are, are nervous. And so what I would do is try to minimize that torque, that kind of, um, let's see if I can turn my little camera on really quick because I feel like I'm like talking. And so I don't know if you can see me, but so I worry about this, right? The yep. Torquing like this. And so, you know, that's what I really worry about. Sorry, my window is sun coming in. <laughs> um, but, you know, I worry about this kind of stuff more than anything. So if you can have a baby laying prone, but be a little like this, you know, I think that, you know, you can do things to bolster the baby. So I hope that helps. Yeah. So 45 Super. degrees, not um, 90. Did, did, It'll go all the way. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so there was a question about single patient rooms having a negative effect. And someone else did mention that Bobby Pineda did a research article that's out there yeah. on single patient use and patient rooms and found that the language skills have some potential for suffering because of lack of exposure. Um, yeah. Anything else other than that, Kathy, that you would um, talk about? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that what that article did, I, th I, I love that, that article. Um, but I think what we also know from that group was that those in that particular unit, they had a, a cohort of babies that went in private rooms and they had a cohort of babies who were kind of back out in bays. And um, what we found was, or what they found is that the babies who were in the private rooms had less language development. Then they went back and they looked at the social. Those kiddos also had less parents who visited. So they ended up not only just being isolated from the environmental exposures, but they actually were isolated from all exposures. And so we ended up, just, those were babies like those Romanian orphan babies, right? So they just didn't get the stimulation that they needed. So the university, um, so Brown University in Rhode Island also has private rooms. They found the exact opposite. And so they actually found that the babies in private rooms did better. So I think that we don't know all the answers, but I think what Bobby Pineda and the Terry Enders group there and St. Louis did is they really helped us realize that there's a difference between sound and noise and that there is a benefit to some sound. And so I think what we're trying to quantify now is what is the right kind of sound? And we want babies to, to get sound exposure and we want them to have the right kind of sound exposure. So I think we don't know all the answers, but I think what that article showed us is that isolation and silence is not what a developing brain needs. And our, our baby's brains need stimulation. If you think about them in utero, they would always be having stimulation. They would be muffled. It would be through water, but they would be getting mom's, mom talking on the phone, mom listening to music, mom you know, talking to her family, mom's stomach. So we know that maternal sound um, is important and may even, as Dr. Teji is saying here, be therapeutic. So I think we, we don't know enough. There are several studies being done and more and more um, research, even in St. Louis, at being able to quantify the kind of sound that's happening. So do I think that private rooms have their advantages? Yes. I think when we need to be aware of isolation, um, so there's a, an asking here about heartbeat. Yeah, absolutely. What if you could record a voice or that you could use music therapy? And I mean, there are other ways to give positive sound. Um, I think there are, again, benefits to single private rooms for families, for isolating from the other kind of noise and noxiousness of the unit, but also it comes with a price if we're not careful. There was an earlier question that I just wanted that I thought was good that I wanted to insert here. Um, if a therapist or a nurse provides additional support to the nurse during the procedure, would that help to lower the pain score? I'm not aware of anybody studying the pain score. Um, but certainly, you know, in, I, I think that there is a fair amount of evidence for the two-person care, which is going to minimize stress. Um, I'm not familiar, but I, I could have missed some of the literature on that, specifically on two-person care. 
But I mean, I think logically it makes sense that any baby who is having less stress is going to have a lower pain and stress score um, and is going to be better facilitated to move into the next experience more smoothly. Um, so if anyone on the line knows of any specific articles on that, you know, please chat them out here. Does that answer Wait, that? You might want to check over here, Kath. Yeah, check over on the side. There's a bunch of stuff going on about research in Boston, music therapy. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence around music and sound. Um, if anybody just went to Graven, I know there was a ton. Um, so someone's asking about sound amplification. Yeah, so this is an interesting question. So I know that there are several um, companies that are looking at um, speaker mo um, like modulating the sound. So like if you're replaying maternal voice, making sure it's not exceeding, you know, the 45 dBs. And, you know, back in the day, you know, we used to just put our little boom boxes and whatnots in the rooms and in the incubators, or we'd put our little Walkman, you know, in there. So I think we do, we are aware that, you know, some sound, you know, there can be amplification, but I think we just need to be aware of it and to, um, to be sure that we're aware and that we're actually monitoring that. And then of course, I think some devices are coming that are going to be able to help us modulate that where you'll, you know, turn Put, you know, plug in some sort of device on the external and that the inter there'll be actually internal speakers that have a max dB. Um, there's questions about waiting for, um, so actually um, question about waiting to the, the, if the baby's out of humidity to do kangaroo. Um, no, um, the, the, you don't need to because the uh, mom actually can actually give off um, some humidity from her own skin and actually can help keep the baby um, quite modulated um, without any issue. I would, I think the biggest risk that we have when babies are in humidity is if we don't protect the microenvironment when we're doing either popping the top, we don't use barriers or things to prevent drafts. And I think that we can cause cold stress in those situations. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, again, if you're having mom do standing transfer, you're minimizing the amount of skin exposure, um, you know, kind of not flying a wet baby across a cold room. And you can actually minimize some of that cold stress that way. But certainly mom, moms actually give off a fair amount of humidity. Um, so I, um, oh, so someone else said that from Portland. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I hope that helps. Yeah, you don't don't worry about that. The benefits of kangaroo outweigh the um, fluid dynamics. <clears throat> Amplification. I'm just kind of scrolling through these. Um, yeah, me too. To see if there's any, or if you have a new question, go ahead and put it. Um, pull the cloth and yeah. So pro How do you balance taking? Yep, How do you ahead. balance taking vital signs and diaper changes and yet not disturb the baby's sleep? Yeah, so I think that's really looking at, you know, obviously you need to do a hands-on assessment at least once a day and and for some babies, you know, more frequently. But I think, you know, if, if you can validate that your, you know, your temperature probes are working well and, you know, then I don't believe in getting axillary temperatures with every hands-on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think, you know, using your monitors, I mean, do you need to, if you don't believe your monitors, I don't, I don't know what to say, but, um, I think I would do that. I would use your monitors. I would validate your equipment is functioning properly early in your shift and then minimize, um, you know, so, if, and, and, and practice that, you know, go from every three to every four and wean yourself and increase your confidence that the devices are working well for you. Um, and I think going back to policy, I think that, you know, some of our policies, you know, are old and outdated and were really necessary when we had different kinds of equipment. And I think now we have such amazing equipment available to us that we can really utilize that to provide minimal hands-on. So I would say, you, you know, use it, validate it, trust it, and then, you know, begin to slowly, you know, creep your, your clinical practice towards something that's... Um, you know, more supportive of the baby. Certainly a very sick baby, you're going to need to touch more. 
So let's take one last question. Is recorded okay. digital sound as effective as natural sound? Does recorded mother's voice mm. equal actual mother's voice? Oh gosh. I w I don't know. I don't know. I think that that any voice is better than no voice. I think that that there is so much more that the mom offers in person, you know, through, you know, hormones and through um, you know, the microbiome and that exposure. Um, so I think there's really no replacement for that physical contact and that 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 in the moment being present. Um, but I think that in so much of what we do in NICU is about finding that middle ground in an in a non-ideal situation. So would would a maternal in-person voice be better? I think it would always outperform a, a recorded voice. And I don't think you'll probably be ever ever be able to study that. Um, but certainly I think that there that some maternal voice, the the baby recognizes maternal scent, the baby recognizes maternal voice. That's been proven. So I think anytime you could offer maternal voice, then I would say yes. Um, there are many people studying the best kinds of sounds. And I'm certainly by no means an expert in this. Um, there are many people who are looking at that. And there are definitely centers who are implementing the use of recorded sounds. Um, some of them sound like, you know, fog horns, and some of them sound like, you know, whales, and some of them sound like crickets. And um, certainly there's a lot of, like I said, really, really smart people who are looking at that um, and trying to find the best for the environment. So even to calm the caregiving environment, but also for directly for patient use. So um, I think we're, we don't know enough. And I think that's a topic that we could definitely explore on a dandelion webinar in the future. Um, because I think there's so much happening in that area. And again, I think at the Gravens conference, just a few weeks ago, there was literally like half a day um, on that. So I can can really not speak to being an expert in any any way. But I would say personally, Number one, yeah, there's no way to get away from the one-on-one -on -one with mom, but I think her voice recorded would always um, be a positive experience for the baby. Awesome. Well, we, so many questions and so many great answers and great discussion again. Thank you, Kathy, so much for this presentation. It's clearly a hot button out there. Um, Dandelion Webinar is just, Dandelion Medical is thrilled to be able to host webinars like this that are cutting edge and give people a lot of information and stimulate good conversation and discussion. Um, now, in order to receive your free CE, you'll, you will need to fill out the webinar evaluation. And Kathy, if you can either in the chat area or on the screen, if you could put up the, the evaluation link, you'll be immediately redirected to the evaluation form if your firewall allows. At the end of the evaluation form, you will receive a link to the CE certificate, which you will have to print yourself and download. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now or your hospital has blocked access, you'll receive an email sometime today or possibly tomorrow um, with a link to the evaluation as well as a link to the recording and the PDF of the slides. Now, if you're um, watching as a group, which I had several people contact me about that this time, you much, must each log into the evaluation form to get the CE. So we hope you'll visit Dandelion Medical website for future webinars and also links to the recordings of our previous, I think we're up to 38 webinars that are still all active and the last three years are still available for continuing education credits. And we hope you have a great weekend, everyone. And thanks so much for your participation. And many thanks to Kathy Randall for another great Dandelion webinar.